Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Hey, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. My guest is Brandon Cobb. He's an entrepreneur in Nashville. He's a co-founder of HGB Capital. Um, they take investor capital. They do a lot of things, but they they build uh, houses is kind of the, the net of it. But we had a really good conversation around all these different pieces of starting and building a business from bringing in a fractional CFO to some of the coaches and mentors he has how he got started raising capital first with uh, debt and then moving over to syndications and, and doing equity, uh, how they grow their investor base, meet their investors, his processes for creating a good investor experience. Then we dive into his hiring systems and what they look for. And there's some very specific actionable things around his hiring systems and how he manages that. We talk a, bit, a little bit about last year, 2022 in the market and pivoting as interest rates uh, went up a lot in a short period of time. A lot of us real estate investors had to pivot and figure some things out. So there's some insight there. Uh, we definitely talk about what they're up to in the future. But Brandon's a really high energy guy, a growth mindset guy, which is one of the reasons I like having this show because you're talking to kind of these high energy entrepreneurs that have gone out risked leaving a corporate job. And in Brandon's case, he was doing medical sales, doing really well and, and liked his job, but uh, got fired and ended up deciding to, to go out on his own and be an entrepreneur. So I, I love these stories. I can't get enough of them. I hope you do too. And Brandon is no stranger to being on podcasts because he was just like bullet point after bullet point after bullet point, had an answer for everything, had very actionable kind of content, whether you're a passive investor or whether you're an operator or aspiring operator. So uh, great podcast, really enjoyed it. I think you will too. Before we jump in, if you're enjoying the DJE podcast first, thanks. Thank you for for uh, joining us. You know, we've been going for a couple of years now and really appreciate these different guests we have on. It would be very helpful and very much appreciated by me if you leave us a five-star review. You could do that in iTunes and that helps the reach. You know, all this stuff is algorithm-based. So uh, five star review would mean a lot to us and the team. Appreciate that, and um, I think you can enjoy this episode with Mr. Brandon Cobb. This episode is brought to you by DJE Texas Management Group, a San Antonio, Texas-based real estate investment firm with a track record of transacting on several hundred million dollars of multifamily land and industrial deals throughout Texas. DJE has been in business for over a decade and is approaching 100 team members in San Antonio. To learn more about DJE, visit djetexas.com or the link in the show notes of this episode. This episode is also brought to you by apartmenteducators.com, a complete ecosystem for professionals to learn how to find, finance, and operate large multifamily properties for profit. You can get started with a free mini course and learn more at apartmenteducators.com or visit the link in the notes. Brandon, welcome to the show. It's great to see you. How's everything going? It's going great. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Glad, glad to have you on the show and excited to dive in and talk about some, some real estate here. We're kind of talking in the green room about all the stuff that, that you guys are up to in this new year here. Um, how about a little background, though, for, for folks listening that have not connected with you or or you know, or not in your universe, um, you know, what's your, what's your backstory and how'd you end up in this real estate game? Yeah, sure. So, uh, I'll give you the today and kind of reverse engineer, you know, today, you know, co-founder of HBG capital, we're primarily focused on recession resistant real estate and helping investors build their dreams, achieve their legacy and impact those close to them through passive income investments. But once upon a time I was in medical device sales and right. unlike a lot of other guests that I hear on podcasts that had a horrible corporate job and needed to get out of it and we're going through a rough time. I actually loved my job. I was, yeah. uh, you know, I was a young guy and it's his twenties and I got to wear scrubs every single day to work. I did the knees and shoulders. So I did orthopedic, uh, orthopedic sports medicine. So a lot of labral tears, a lot of anchors, rotator cuff tears, ACL reconstructions. I was working with the doctors who are working with the athletes and being in surgery every single day, working with the surgery staff, having my products 
help a patient get back on the field, I, yeah. I was like, I hit it out of the park. I um, was Love making it. decent money and loved what I did. And I remember one specific Friday, my boss wanted to meet and I'd just gotten out of a, a successful surgery. Everything went right for my product. Everything went wrong for my competitors. We we're picking up some capital equipment at that particular hospital. So it was like a triple whammy home run of a deal. And I meet him at Starbucks and I'm like excited to like tell him what happened. And I told him what happened. And I look at the look on his face and he didn't seem that excited. I was like, what's going on? And then he proceeded to fire me. And I'll never forget the shock that I felt during that moment. I was just confused. And for the first three hours, I, I, I just couldn't think straight. I was like, what did I do wrong? I got this sales award. I work all the time. Uh, you know, I, I loved what I did. I thought I had a great relationship with my boss. And I learned that, you know, companies have to do whatever's best for the company. And for whatever reason, that was to let me go. But I learned at that moment in time that nobody was going to look out for my financial well being but me. You can yeah. be as loyal as you want to a company. You can put as many hours, blood, sweat, and tears into it. And at the end of the day, that company has to do whatever's best for them. So you're not really ever protected. And I think that the old mindset is like, oh, you know, go work for a company, work your way up, you know, I'll be safe. And that's just not the reality. So I learned that nobody was going to luck out for my financial well-being but me. And so started on this journey of starting multiple companies that failed. Real estate just happened to be the first one that took off. And as soon as I was able to generate some money from that business, I just, I cut all the other ones out completely and just poured my heart and soul into the industry. Started flipping houses, started wholesaling houses, started a construction company, uh, had a need to raise some money at some point, which was how HBG Capital was born. So, you know, sure. you get to the point where you've, you can only scale so much with your own funds, especially when you're flipping houses and building houses. It takes up a lot of capital. And so at that point, after years of working with our own funds, we've decided, hey, look, we need to bring some outside investors in. And that's when things really started to take off for us. Yeah, I love it. Uh, that's, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing all that. How long were you doing all the companies trying to figure out you know, which one was going to hit? Was that a a long period, a short period? It was about a year. So I thought I wanted to be the next Tony Robbins. I love motivation. I love mindset. And so I yeah. had this coaching business. I was trying to get off its feet. They tell you when you're taking all these entrepreneurial courses, like focus on what you're good at, like what value you can. I was like, well, I've had a lot of people reach out to me over the years trying to break into medical device sales. Why don't I try to build a course? That'd be kind of cool. I've got some knowledge on that. I broke in at a young age. So sure. I built this course. That failed. That didn't work out. I had a online blog that I was also starting to do. And I was doing this thing on the side called real estate and knew I needed a mentor, started going to all the meetups, was just trying to find someone to add value to. I knew that that was going to be the key for me to kind of get where I needed to go and ended up meeting my mentor at the time. And he's still my business partner to this day. Excellent. Yeah, that's so funny. I, I had a similar deal where it's corporate job. And, and uh, there was one time I got fired, which I think really was the genesis of me wanting to be an entrepreneur. I was like, I don't ever want that to happen again. It's the same kind of epiphany as you. It's like, boy, no matter what you're doing, you're, you're right. You're ultimately responsible for your financial future. And then I had a few years of doing a lot of different stuff, just trying to figure it out and never thought it would have been real estate. But it's like you look at what's working and what's not. And real estate's pretty do uh, a method. So what was your first real estate project? Was it a house flip? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a house yeah. flip. I was waking up at six in the morning, driving down every single day to manage it. Now, yep. to give you some background, I don't know which way to, to flip a hammer. Okay. And that's, right. that's, that is no lie. Uh, when I say I'm green, when it comes to construction, I was green, but I was willing to figure it out. Just sure. having the opportunity to try to make some money myself was exciting to me. And I made every mistake in the book. Right. I hired Craigslist contractors, right? I was like neck, neck doing the work with them side by side, which I think actually benefited me in that situation, but ended up <laughs> flipping that house and we made about $30,000 on it. And I mean, I went all in, I cashed out my 401ks, my retirement accounts uh, to buy that house yep. and made about 30 grand. And I did what anybody who has read the books, listened to the podcast, taken the advice did. 
I just dumped it all back into the business, mainly in the form of marketing. And so when you dump $30,000 in the form of marketing and you've got this medical device sales background, I had kind of an advantage, I would say, over a lot of the other companies that we were competing with, kind of unknowingly with my background. And that marketing yeah, produced huh? four or five other deals and we were able right. to just keep the snowball rolling. Yeah. I love it. You mentioned going all in. I, I think that's a really important piece of a successful on, uh, entrepreneur's journey. A, a, and what was your thought process there? Just doing it out of necessity? Had you, did you have a burn the boats mentality? What was that like for you? And what did it feel like when you did it? When I saw that it was possible to make money, I gave myself a six month ultimatum. I had luckily built a very good foundation. I'd lived very well below my means. I had about $111,000 saved up and I, you know, I had like no debt whatsoever, paid cash for car, low monthly rent. I mean, nothing. Right. And I was like, well, by December 12th, 2016, whenever it was, if I don't make any money, I'll just go back to getting a job. So I had set myself up mentally to be okay with the worst case scenario. And when you set yourself up to be okay with the worst case scenario, anything is possible. Now, at the same time, when I saw that it was possible to make money myself, it's like waking up. There's no feeling that can describe when you first start your entrepreneurial journey and you start to kind of see some results. Like when I got that property under contract and I'm sitting at the closing table and I've never bought anything before, I'm like, wow, look at what the results are. That becomes addicting. And so everything at that point became, how can I get my hands on as much material, as much coaching, as much masterminds and communities that are going to help me like on this journey? And from that point, it became fun because when you start getting results and you get that addiction and you're able to make more and more money through your own just blood, sweat and tears, the sky's the limit. Now, combine that with like no wife and kids. And I mean, I was young. I was ready to go. I just I could just work, work, work. I think that was a big reason why we were have the, able to have the success, you know, early on. It was a lot of sweat equity and excitement that was put into it. Yeah, there, that is something really that's uh, an incredible pivotal point in an entrepreneur's journey when you're like, wait a minute, I'll, like my my inputs are the outputs. And I think the bigger company you work for is not the case. I mean, in sales, it's it's you get a pretty clear uh, marriage between those two, but a lot of times, you know, it's like your input. Is, is not um, coming back to you. That's one of the things I loved about starting my, the companies and being entrepreneurs. Like whatever the limit of my hard work and ingenuity is, that all, all you know, benefits me. And that that felt really liberating. And it's, you know, the, the, there's no there's no ceiling and there's, there's no floor either, right? It's all you and you're out there without a net, but it's a pretty exciting way to be, especially I think if it's kind of geared towards your personality type, which seems like very much geared towards your personality type. You remember, you mentioned the, you know, personal development and, uh, and this kind of thing. So being an entrepreneur is definitely good on the, it's like the best thing for personal development, right? Yeah. I think you hit it on the head too. A lot of people don't wake up because they're working in a job where their input is output for the company, right? They don't see, touch and feel it. And that's yeah. probably why they get burned out is, I heard somebody say this definition of burnout. It was doing something without seeing an end in sight. And mm -hmm. I think that's a great definition of burnout. And I think that's why a lot of people get burned out. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so what does your day look like today? You got a lot of stuff going on. What, what, where are you, where are your strengths and what do you kind of get energy out of in your, in your work day? And where do you try to spend your time? Well, the best place to start is a time audit. If somebody hasn't done a time audit and actually seen a pie chart of what they're doing on a weekly basis broken down, you need to stop everything and do it. Set your alarm to go off every hour, fill in the Excel sheet of how many minutes you work doing each item. And then once you have the data over a week, look and see where you're spending your time and assign a dollar per hour activity to it. it. Once I did that, that dictated what my schedule was. So I try to focus on the $1,000 and $10,000 per activity. So what exactly are those? That's finding strategic partners. 
So who are the people that I can bring into my organization to plug the gaps and holes and efficiencies that they're seeing? For example, last year, we brought on a fractional CFO into the organization that had worked for a national builder. That changed everything as far as cash flow reports, how much money we were going to have available, how much money we were going to, you know, be able to pay out to investors, you know, where we're over budget, implementing cost codes. That was a huge, huge moment for us. I'm focused on hiring not just strategic partners, but the right coaches. So, you know, I got like a 19 on my ACT, right? And I feel like the ACT is is a measure of like people's intelligence these days. All it does is measurability, take a test. I don't consider myself a very smart person, like high IQ, but I am pretty good at putting myself in rooms with people who are much, much smarter than me and then trying to figure out ways to add value to them. So I try to either pay for coaching or pay for masterminds or figure out who's already done what I'm trying to do and then figure out some unique way to add value to that person. And then I'm also focused on raising capital and running the operations of the company. So like those four main tasks right there, raising money, uh, finding strategic partners, putting myself in rooms with people who've already accomplished what I'm trying to do. And um, then I think it said hiring the strategic partners or running operations, one of those two. Those are the main four activities that I try to fill most of my time up with. Yeah, I love it. And I really like the breakdown of the time on it, the dollar per hour activity. Uh, it did something similar many years ago, and it just changed the way that that I think. And it's something along the lines of what, what you just said. And I mean, as entrepreneurs, you you have to do that. So I, I love that. Uh, I love that advice. Curious on the fractional CFO, what um, was that a limited time engagement where they came in and kind of looked at everything and did the work, turned it over and, and see you later? Do you still have them on retainer for a couple hours a week? What does that look like for your for your companies? Yeah, so it's a monthly fee and we didn't need a full-time CFO because sure. you know we had the bookkeeping, we had the sourcing manager, we kind of had the backbone built, but we needed I needed somebody who had worked at a company that what we're trying to get to, you know, like we're trying to get to producing at least 300 units per year and either entry level homes that are designed to be insulated against, you know, market volatility or these build direct communities. And so I don't have the financial background to be able to produce what is needed to generate those types of products and figure out what it's going to take to produce them. So I was very specific. I knew I needed a part-time person that had the background working for like a national builder, big boy builder. And after interviewing a lot of CFOs, and by the way, if you're listening to this and you're thinking about getting into fractional CFO world, if you've got like an accounting background or a a finance background, you've done this, get into it. Like it is probably the industry that is poised for the most growth because there's such a need. I mean, it's the point where people just wouldn't answer their phones because they had so much business. (laughs) <laughs> um, but I knew what I was looking for when I was going after this position. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that. I, I love it. And I, I love that that's worked for you guys. Well, let's, let's shift gears to raising capital. You know, you start out as an entrepreneur, you kind of run it on your own steam. At some point, if you want to grow a company in almost, in most cases, there's going to be an infusion of capital through a debt, equity, family loan, et cetera. What was your first? foray into OPM, other people's money for, for running your business? So we had used our own funds for you know the first three, four years. And like I said, we were having trouble growing because when all your stuff stuck, then you can't put the money into hiring the right people, the right operations, the right coaching, the right masterminds. And so we had worked with some like hard money lenders. So we weren't unfamiliar with it, but we were paying outrageous sums or overhead per month, just in interest payments was crazy. And I'm like, well, what if we could eliminate these monthly payments and get them down? And so through our networking efforts and seeing what other people in the communities that I was in were doing, I said, oh, we can pay investors to fund the construction and you know these house flips, whatever we were doing at the time. And so I started reaching out kind of just cold turkey to my friends and family. And some people that I had networked with in the real estate industry found out that people wanted to lend on real estate, you know, and it's a super hot topic and it's all over the news on how much real estate's going up and how it's never going to go down. Then it becomes a lot easier to raise capital. You think it's you, but no, it's it's really the market. So there was some humility to it. So I kind of timed everything perfect. And so we got to the point where we, we probably had, you know, three, $4 million of private funds out. And I was doing the math of 
what it was going to take to get to the, you know, 300 homes a year, which is our current goal. And I was like, I'm going to have to raise like 25 million more dollars. Holy yeah. freak. This is going to take forever. And yep. so I was, you know, kind of a little set back by that. Uh, investors were, were making money. They were really happy, but we were doing promissory notes, meaning I was able to pay them about 10%. And was able to postpone the monthly payments until we would sell the product. So there was eliminated all of the overhead and the interest payments. But I was kind of stuck on how many deals I could do. And then I was introduced to the syndication model. And so with the syndication model, it's no longer a debt position that we were taking on. It was an equity position through these LLCs and these funds. And I realized that you could use equity to not just generate higher returns through going out and getting additional financing on top of it, debt financing. But because the profits were more, I could pay investors more. And so when I was able to come to my investors and say, hey, you know, we're almost going to double what we're able to pay you. Holy smoly, they were really excited about that. And then as we started turning and burning these deals, and one of the things I really liked about the build to sell model that's a little bit different than multifamily is you turn and burn people's money faster and so you're able to grow right. it a lot quicker because most people want to wait until, you know, three, four or five years, whenever the turnaround time of a multifamily deal usually is. And that was able to help us grow much quicker because we were able to get these quick turns, you know, within a year usually. And that's what really allowed us to grow and scale our current portfolio with our investor base. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Switching from debt to equities. Uh, that's a good one. And that's cool. You're able to take people along for the ride. Um, that and so you guys are still actively growing that. Is it has it been kind of a referral deal? Are you out there doing marketing? How do you kind of handle your growing your investor base? You know, so we get quite a few referrals. So we've got had investors that have been with us for multiple years now, some some four or five years. And when you've got people that have been with you for that long, you've turned their money that many times. You know, they they usually either invest more or they bring someone with them. Surprisingly, you know, probably 20, 30% of the newly raised capital that we raise every year is from our current existing investor base. We, we've sure. had investors that have started with $200,000 and they've grown it to two and a half million dollars, right? So you just never know where it's going to come uh, from. So that's one way we're raising. I'm very heavily focused on our investor experience roadmap, because I figured this out early on, the better experience you can give somebody. If you can go like, I use my own personal funds and I invest in other people's syndications because I want to see what their customer service is like. I want to yep. see what the transparency is like. I want to feel like what, what is lacking on me? Like, what am I not getting? And then I'll take that and apply it to ours and I'll give them this great experience. And as a result, they end up giving more money. So that's one way of raising money. The other way is, you know, we've continuously kept in touch with people in our CRM system. They come in through the funnel. We do we do a lot of podcasts like this. Um, so okay. a lot of people hear about us from other podcasts. I call it other people's stages. Uh, we've got our own podcast that people find us on. You know, we post every single day in social media with the intent of trying to add value. So some kind of content that's geared towards our target avatar. We're creating content every single day and releasing that. Um I think a lot of people misunderstand social media. They see it as a lead generation tool and it can be, but the main goal of social media or the main use is actually to take the lead that's come into your funnel, the potential investor. Usually they've come into your funnel. Usually they're not ready to invest day one, but when you're able to bring them into your world and stay in touch with them through your social media posts that they see once they are in a position to invest and you're the first person that comes to mind because they're seeing your content over more than anybody else's, I think that's really a great tool with social media because the money's the money in any kind of sell, whether it's raising money or you're selling to a doctor or you're selling building products, the money's made in the follow-up. You're not going to get the sell the first time. So I think the success in anything that's a sales process is going to be how can you stay relevant to your target customer? I love it. That's a, that's such great insight on that whole marketing funnel. And I totally agree with the investor experience component is if we're building a referral based business here, let's focus all our energy and resources on this incredible investor experience. And, you know, people do our marketing for us if we get that right. 
So mm -hmm. I love it. Well, let's let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I want to talk about your hiring systems. You know, that's something I'm, I'm uh, endlessly fascinated by. And you know, for growing a business to any scale, we're working with more and more people. So that's really important. What's the team look like now? And and what are your you know what's your philosophy on on hiring and, and managing that team? Yeah, so we've got an acquisition team that's more seller facing. We've got a construction team, and then we've got a capital raising team. Uh, we're eight strong. You know, I've, I'm blessed to be a part of a team that's able to do a lot with very little. I used to think that it was sexy to build this big, huge, humongousoid cash eating monster. And yeah. that's kind of changed right. over time. Yeah. I'm like, wow, the really sexy businesses are the lean ones that are able to take a few people and produce huge results. You know, like yes. Kylie, uh, I think Kylie Jenner was able to do something like 250 million in her business with like 11 people. That's wow. a sexy business, man. Like that's, uh, that's what I grow and aspire to be. But the reason we're able to do that is because of our hiring systems and processes. And I could probably spend an hour talking about this, but I'll, I'll make it really short and I'll kind of do high level. I'm going to give you two dominoes that if you just do these two things, I can almost guarantee you're going to improve your systems and processes with your hiring. Number one is the mindset of hiring a strategic partner, not an employee. I think most people yeah. make the mistake of hiring down and, oh, I'm going to have to train this person and you know I'm, I need to pay them as little as possible. If you're a small business, especially, the only way you're going to get exponential growth is bringing people into the organization that can advise you on what to do in that department. So if this person cannot come into the organization, and I love using this CFO example, and show you where the gaps and inefficiencies are during the interview process, show you what you're doing wrong, show you how they can blow it up and make it better, then don't hire that person. Who, right. not how. The second is through the use of behavioral style interviewing. So I think the biggest mistake people make during the interview process is they ask these canned questions and they get these canned answers. Tell me about your greatest strengths. Let's see what your strengths are. They've got something they've fabricated and they've got this wall, this facade kind of over them, right. sort of getting through. Um, right. Or, you know, what are your weaknesses? All that crap. You want to be able to identify what are the skills you're after and what questions can I ask to elicit those skills? And the only way to do that, in my opinion, is behavioral style interviewing. So, for example, if I'm hiring a project manager or superintendent, I'll ask, hey, Tell me about a time that you had to fire a subcontractor. How did you make that decision? And how did you go about finding his replacement? If I'm hiring a sales rep and I'm looking for the skill to be able to influence and convert, tell me about a time. Tell me a story where you got a customer to start talking about their problems. Or how were you able to change? Tell me a story. Everything is story-based because it's really hard to BS stories. So those two things alone. But in the initial stages... Everything we use is through Wise Hire. I love Wise Hire. I'm not going to go into why. They've got a nice funnel system, but use Wise Hire. It's great. And we start off with some very basic questions. Really, I just want to know if they're worth my time. So I have my VA go through. She filters everybody out based on experience. I set up, she sets up the phone calls and it's, you know, my first question, and this is going to dictate a lot whether or not they get to the next round, is tell me what stood out about this opportunity in our company to you. And if they don't answer that question and they didn't prepare, that tells me that they're not just not the right fit, right? It's an easy question. The next are around pay because I've gotten to the interview process at the very end and realized we we're off on pay. So I'll ask about pay, look at what they want for growth opportunities. You know, tell me where you, you know, like, what do you want to get out of this long term? And then at the end, what questions do you have for me? They don't have any questions for me and they don't pass those questions. I mean, this is 15 minutes really quick. Then I know that they didn't pass the smell test. We're not going to go. The next step is everyone in our company has to be adaptable to technology. So I'll send that candidate a Loom video, just a video of me telling them like, hey, I need you to answer these questions. And what I'm doing now is I've shifted step one, which is the riffraff, right? The people, the tire kickers, the people who are not worth my time. And now I want to see if they have our core values. So again, for example, one of our core values is growth. So I send them a video and I ask them, four or five questions. And I want them to send me a video back. Cause one, I want to see if I like them, like if our personality is going to mesh, you know, yes. I've, I've had in-person interviews that are an hour and a half long. And I'm like, I just can't stand this person. So I want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so I'll do that. And I want to make sure that they're a cultural fit. 
So yep. I'll ask them, tell me about the past four or five books and podcasts you've listened to. And I know that if they're not reading books or listening to podcasts, they are they don't have that growth core value. So we don't hire them. Everybody in our organization is trying to get better and get to the next level. So once we've screened for the core values and I like those, then that's when we go into the in-person interview. And that's where I'm mainly asking behavioral style interviews because I want them to have the skill set and I want them to have the core values of the organization. So once we get to the in-person interview, it's all story time, baby. I want to hear stories of times when you did this, when you did that. If they pass that, now it gets exciting because they do a ride along. So this is where they're actually going to come into the field. If you're a sales rep, guess what? You're coming on sales calls. If you're a superintendent, you're coming out on the project. And the whole goal is to actually see if they can do what they say they can do. And so we'll actually bring the superintendents and walk them through a project whom we already know where the gaps and the problems are. And we want to see if they can actually find the holes. Remember I said, hire strategic partners. This is where that comes in. You want to be able to make sure they can unearth these problems. If they pass that, then we do a mock work day where we pay them for a full day of work. And we cool. actually want to see how they mesh with the team. And if they pass that, then we send them the offer letter. I really like that mock work day. That's a nice, easy way to test out a whole bunch of things and very low cost too. Yeah. How it, many people do not get through, you know, they do the mock work day and then they don't get hired. Is I've had that, people that, that I was, I was like, man, this guy's gonna be a great fit. And then we did the mock work day and they just didn't show up. Ah, well, there you go. I don't, That's I easy. think that they knew that they were like, crap, they're, you know, like I was trying to BS my way through this. And like, you can't BS a walkthrough on a job site or a, or a sales call. So, yeah. um, yeah, it gets really interesting. It's, it's very important. Cause if, if I just hired that person instead of doing the mock work day, that would have been a disaster. Disaster. Yeah. Yeah. They'd be on for three months maybe. And I'll kind of, yeah, I love, I love that mock work day concept and the, and the whole framework. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, you mentioned we talk all day and night about that stuff, but uh, that's a very good overview. And, and um, you know, this is one of the most important components of building the company. So I appreciate your detail there. I want to talk about something you mentioned earlier. Uh, it might even been before we start recording here, but about pivoting. You know, we're talking in early 2023 right now, and this podcast will be released in the same time frame. you know, early 2023. 2022 was interesting, kind of ended a lot differently than that year started last year. So, you know, talk to me about pivoting and what you guys have done um, to address the changing marketplace. Yeah. So we're in real estate. The cheese moves very quickly. I was on a podcast yeah, with somebody just a couple of weeks ago and he'd been in real estate for 30 years. And I always ask the guys who have, you know, who are way smarter than me and have way more experience, you know, you know, what have you learned? You know, what do you wish you'd done differently? And he's like, honestly, I would always, when I was younger, I had a strategy and I would just go test that strategy against the market. And man, I can't tell you how many times I fell on my face. He goes, you don't dictate the strategy, the market dictates the strategy, and then you go execute that strategy. And I, I could say that I think that sums it up so well, depending on yeah. the economic environment we're in, certain asset classes are going to do well and, and certain aren't. But my thinking behind how to pivot has to do with following the money. So during an economic contraction or whatever economic circumstance we're in, is money going to continue to flow into that asset class? or not. So that dictates my investment thesis. Where do I want to invest? What asset class do I want to invest? Do I want to be an operator on this particular deal? And this is kind of what has led us to now. What we're primarily focused on is entry-level housing and build-to-rent communities. And we like that because we can we think that money is going to continue to pour into that asset class, specifically in, in high-growth markets where there's fundamentals. So what are the fundamentals? Like, What are we looking for? So from a macro environment, number one, we want to see money coming into a specific area. Well, how do you know if money is going to come into a specific area? COVID did something very interesting. Mm -hmm. It revealed an environment that was sort of already there, but just really blew it up and stuck it in everyone's face, which is you've got business-friendly states and you've got non-business-friendly states. Yep. And everybody became very aware of that. And especially the big boys, the institutional money felt that when all their businesses were getting shut down 
by the non-business friendly states. And you had places like Tennessee, Texas, Florida that still kept everything open and things flourished. So you have a mass exodus of billions and billions of dollars flowing to these business friendly states. So we want to be there. The second is we want to be in states that support growth. So Nashville, one of the reasons we like Nashville is it's been one of the top 10 fastest growing cities. It's got year-round tourism. That tells me that when people are moving somewhere, when you've got year-round tourism, money is going to continue to flow into that city. Mm -hmm. Great. It also has no state income taxes, similar to Florida, which means that's more incentives for businesses to move here. Businesses bring people. People bring money. So it covers the macros. Now, once we've got the macro set, you know, what asset class do we want to invest in? Well, in my opinion, when you get these economic contractions, certain needs are going to go away and certain needs are going to be there, right? You know, you saw toilet paper fly off the shelf during, during yeah. COVID, right? I don't think toilet paper is ever going to go away, but the ability to take a vacation and rent an Airbnb might, depending on you know who it's catered to. The need to live is never going to go away. As there's these economic contractions, as interest rates go up, as the mortgages change, people still need somewhere to live. And they still want to buy a home. So if we can be in these entry level homes, you know, three hundred eighty five thousand and less, you know, targeting what, in my opinion, is the most undersupplied, highest demand real estate product in the country right now. You know, entry level housing. Less than ten percent of all homes that are being built are entry level housing, affordable housing, because everyone's got these outrageous construction costs and land costs. If you can be in that asset class, money should still continue to pour into it because people need a place to live. And if you can manage, if you can remove the risk of hiring a bad builder um, or, you know, finding deep equity off, off market deals, you know, not buying retail price deals. If you can build a lot of equity in through it, through finding them and rezoning the land to higher density and managing it yourself, like what we do, we've, almost removed, I'm not going to say all the risk because there's always risk associated with it, but we've removed a lot of the risk that can hinder a development or a assets performance from, from going under. So that's sort of where we've bit, we pivoted to, you know, we're focused on building these cash flowing communities, smaller homes, 1200, 13, 1400 square feet products where we can get the price down a lot where it's in that, that price range that we're seeing still moving despite what the market's doing. I love it. Thank you for the overview on that. And I think that uh, makes a lot of sense from the macro and all the way down to the asset class. What are you guys, um, what do you, give, given, you know, kind of the environment we're in, what happened last year and your history and trajectory of the company, what do you guys see ahead for the year? What are your, what are your goals and ambitions for, for what's ahead this year? Yeah. So we're, we've got 109 lots we're sitting on that we're underwriting for build to rent. We're not going to completely do away with build to sell. Again, we're building smaller homes. And yep. a lot of the problems that we're seeing today is supply chain issues and costs. So we started our own supply company. You know, we were able to reduce a decent portion of the material cost by like literally reduced it by 70%. I mean, it's just a complete game changer. And by nope, stocking yeah. the materials in our warehouse, yeah. There's no supply chain issue. We're constantly able to pull from that warehouse. So we're really focused on mitigating the current market problems that we're seeing and focusing on building these cash flowing communities that are underwritten for either a build to sell product, entry level 385,000 and less, where we've got the products readily available, or these build to rent cash flowing communities that we can then do whatever we want. We're focusing on building a portfolio. That's one thing we've done a bad job of in the past, we've built and sold everything. And so right. it just creates this big tax problem. And we've done very little aside from my personal investments, investing in depreciable assets to capture that depreciation for ourselves and our investors on our investment. So we we see affordable entry-level homes and build to rent communities as the way ahead for us. Yeah, that's great. That makes perfect sense. I mean, in the beginning, look, you're, you're flipping stuff and you're generating a lot of cash and that's really necessary and helpful, especially in the early years. So that's great. But at some point you shift gears to to uh, build some kind of portfolio and cash flow depreciation because it doesn't matter how much you make, right? It's all about to take home. So. How much do you keep? That's <laughs> yeah. exactly right. I love it. Well, Brandon, I, I, I love talking to entrepreneurs. You, I, I love hearing your journey. You guys have, have built a lot and you, you know, you've You've got all these different facets that sound like they're firing on all cylinders from the hiring and the capital raising and the 
the asset classes. So I just love connecting with people that are that are out there making it happen. If somebody listening wants to connect with you and learn more about what you're up to, how can they do that? Yeah. So if you're somebody who's interested in unique real estate investments, uh, you know, entry level housing, and you're interested in, you know, achieving your dreams and impacting those close to you through passive income secured by unique real estate investments, you know, we've got a website with a ton of free resources, uh, hbgcapital.net. That's Harry Bob Gary Capital.net. I joked that the dot com was not available, so we had to go with dot net. But on that website, we've got a free ebook, Recession Resistant Real Estate, breaks down, you know, the different various recession resistant real estate product types, kind of why we're focused on entry level housing and build to rent. Uh, we've got another book on there that is 100 questions passive investors should be asking before investing. I got a call one time from one of our current investors who had a friend who lost all of his investment. I think it was around $150,000 to a real estate syndication. Yeah. And he's like, can you talk to this guy just to see what his options are? And I, and I spoke with him. And after talking with him, I realized that like, he didn't do anything right. Like he didn't vet the paperwork. There was like no paperwork. There was no securitization. And the reason that happened was he was so new to it. He didn't know what questions to ask. Yeah. And so I wrote that book, 100 questions, passive investors should be asking for investing with the hopes that if I can just prevent one other person from losing or making this mistake, like it would be totally worth it. So um, you can go to our website and grab all that stuff for free. Awesome. We'll link to it in the show notes. If you're listening, you can scroll down into the, uh, the notes for the show there and click straight through the website and check that out. Brandon, it's awesome to catch up. Thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, this was fun. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll see you. See ya. Thank you for listening to the DJE podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.